I got the link, Purushottam. Copied it from there. Saloni, I've shared the link with you. Saloni? Andy, ma'am. Uh, I've shared the YouTube live link with you. Andy, ma'am. I've just done it. I just called Saloni, sir. He, uh, Abhi, uh, he's not picking the phone. I'm coordinating. Thank you, ma'am.
सलोनी यस मैम uh but he sir was stuck in a jam and he was able to reach the college just now he is starting the session in another 5 minutes can you put uh, please put this on youtube live in writing also in the chat sure ma'am i'll just write thank you absolutely thank you
Hello, Dr. Anjali. A very good, good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, can we start, sir? Uh, of course. Am I yes. audible? Yeah. Good evening. Uh, your voice is. Ji, sir? Your voice. Saloni, is my voice cracking? Yes, ma'am. I think there's, there's something with the network. Now it's okay, ma'am. It's, sir, is it yeah. okay now? Yes, yeah, better. It's better. Yeah. We'll just start. Uh, a very uh, good evening to everybody. I welcome you all to this second last day of the uh, two weeks online interdisciplinary international refresher course on Academic Bank of Credits, ABC scheme in higher education, UGC regulation 2021 with reference to blended learning. I, Dr. Anjali Gupta, welcome you all on behalf of Teaching Learning Center, Ramanujan College, Center for Canadian Studies, South Campus, University of Delhi, and Indian Accounting Association, NCR chapter. For this session, we have with us Professor Sanjeev Singh, Director, DUCC, Professor, Institute of Informatics and Communication, South Campus. Sir, has been a professor and has worked in the area of optical electronics and obtained his doctorate in electronics from the University of Delhi in 1997. To his credit, Sir has uh, around 70 research publications in national and international journals and his areas of specialization are network, security and communication technology. Sir is the visiting fellow to University of Manchester in Science and Technology, UK, under Commonwealth uh, Fellowship. And he is the spearhead uh, in the innovation, innovative projects like Cross-Cultural Innovation Network, sponsored by U European Commission. Professor Singh has completed several major research projects sponsored by various government agencies of India and is on the advisory panel of various learned bodies. Professor Singh represents India in ITU Standard Committee and has developed a standard framework for mobile app security. Sir chairs the National Committee on Wearable Devices at Bureau of Indian Standards, uh, Ministry of Information Technology, Government of India. Professor Singh is Network Fellow of Commonwealth Partnerships in Technology Management, London, UK, and European uh, EU India Cross Cultural Innovation Network. Sir is the member of Innovation, Cultural, and Science and Technology Parks and is a certified professional from DADO, Inopolis, South Africa, to develop science and technology parks and innovation cl clusters. Professor Singh is the member of National IT Committee, FICCI, and has consist conducted various ICT-based training programs and workshops for faculty development uh, programs uh, uh, conducted in different universities and uh, institutions all over the country. We welcome you, sir, and definitely we are obliged that you agreed to be uh, the resource person for another session. And definitely, sir, I would like to state here that uh, the last session that you had in our risk pressure course was very amazing and appreciated by a lot of participants. Some of the participants even called me to get your email ID and contact uh, details and really asked me to requested me that I should communicate to you that they really enjoyed the session. So same Thank you so much. using this public platform to uh, convey the message of those participants to you. Thank you, sir, oh. for being there for us. Now over to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, there's just a little correction that was not South Africa, it's a South Korea. Yes. So uh, the innovation part, right? So uh, thanks very much for uh, having me here. And uh, I think this is uh, all this is August gathering where all the like-minded people are, you know, uh, have joined us. 
and uh, is a Catholic fraternity from Delhi University and maybe many more other universities across India. So I think this is uh, one of the longest refresher program I've seen online. You guys are <laughs> conducting. I think it's more more than more than twenty days, I believe. Yeah. So uh, you see, in the last session we we talked about uh, uh, the digital learning and all that, right? So what are the possibilities? What are the challenges? What are the issues we are facing? And what are the next step universities are trying to make? So now today I would like to touch upon, uh, you know, as a topic was given to me, the assessment and the evaluation, right? And uh, how it's being done. But it is more relevant when, uh, you know, uh, when talk about uh, the behavioral aspects of uh, teaching and learning, right? So what are the processes uh, associated with teaching and learning and many other things Then how we relate the assessment and evaluation? We need to understand categorically the difference between the uh, between these two processes because these are two ident similar uh, similar looking processes but they are uh, conceptually they are very different right so we need to understand uh, why these processes are required uh, because we need to uh, do both the processes of uh, evaluation and uh, you know, the, the assessment right and how we can take part in the dif in different uh, you know uh, uh, you know, processes and how effectively and how we can innovate within those processes, we need to understand that. And that is why uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll talk about one or uh, maybe a couple of case studies, uh, how evaluation is being done nowadays. In fact, in the period of this pandemic situation. So, so, uh, so teaching and learning uh, is more to do with, uh, you know, uh, the the processes involved in, in delivery, right? And whatever content we deliver. So uh, I'll run you through some of the slides, uh, maybe here, right? Can you guys see, see this? So assessment evaluation, right? And uh, in, in the perspective of teaching and learning process, right? So the first line is uh, the teaching learning process. A thousand teachers and you see a thousand methods, right? So each teacher uh, may have a different method for carrying out teaching and learning process, uh, evaluation, assessment. And as a Chinese proverb, this is uh, really fantastic and very, very apt. So I'll, and now I'll be showing some of the, you know, uh, two liners to uh, invoke your mind that what we have been doing and what we are doing and what we are supposed to do in the present time in the future. Right. So now, uh, especially in Delhi University, right, uh, we have been conducting the open book examination. And this is the worldwide, you know, standard for, for evaluation, for assessment, for the students while they are studying, right? And open book is such a great tool to assess the students in such a way that their core knowledge can be evaluated. But it entirely depends on how much, uh, you know, the concept of open book examination has been embedded while you are making the question paper, right? So sometimes we have noticed the question paper uh, of open book exam is as good as the you know regular exam, so it really doesn't make any difference. So and then we crib about that uh, there is a copying and all these kind of things. Students are involved in different uh, you know wrong practices, but it is not because your questions are our questions are not designed in such a way, right? Otherwise, the idea is to allow uh, these students to sit together, you know, and give the exams. So this is the whole, uh, you know, concept of open book examination, and this is the right way of uh, assessing the student's knowledge. So this is a few points I have laid down. Uh, what is uh, we are talking all about and definitions of terms related to teaching and learning processes and how effective teaching and learning processes are and process of learning and aspect of teaching learning and information processing. So, I mean, this is strange that uh, I'm putting up this slide because all of us, we belong to the same uh, fraternity. So we, I don't have to explain what the teaching is. But still, I, I thought that I'm share that how globally we define teaching. 
uh, it's a process of interacting with anyone. So it's, teaching is not confined only within the classroom, the domain between the conversation between the student and the teacher. It can happen anywhere. It can take place anywhere while you are in traveling in metro or you are flying somewhere. The interaction can be converted into a teaching. It depends on your approach and what you are talking about and what how much your learning capacity is. So it's basically the intent and how uh, the content is being shared by the person among the individuals and the group of people. So the process of engaging students in activities that will enable them to acquire the knowledge, skills, as well as worthwhile values and attitudes. So this is how uh, we need to define the teaching. And it is not only the monologue, it's how, how effectively we interact with the students and create and develop the environment of du dual communication. So, so both ways communication should happen and, uh, and how within that communication we embed components like knowledge, skills, and other behavioral aspects of uh, you know, uh, behavior of teaching. So approach is a set of principles, believe, like all teachers, all of us, we, we are aware of uh, you know, the ideas about the nature of learning, which is translated into the classroom. So all the teachers, they have been, you know, uh, you know uh, they are preparing themselves. They are, uh, most of the teachers, they prepare their notes, they make their slides, they make their, you know, uh, uh, other, you know, resources and pull in resources from other places, different universities, libraries and all. And how they put together in, in, in a sort of a storyboard, they prepare their talk, their lecture, and uh, which converts that into a theory classroom. So these are a few examples of teaching approaches. Uh, there are two aspects. One is a teacher-centric, one is a learner-centered. So when it's more teacher-centered, so is a subject matter-centered, teacher-dominated, is a banking approach, all the students are banking on the teacher, is a disciplinary, individualistic, indirect, and guided, right? When you compare it with the learner center system, so it's a learner centered, then uh, interactive, constructive, and uh, integrated, is more collaborative, and is direct, right? So once we are, you know, if you uh, have some experience of peer learning, so, uh, whatever is happening and the content being shared within the peer group, right? So their productivity and uh, the productivity of the students who are actually attending the classrooms are entirely different. Their approach is different. So they are more innovative, they are more creative, and that is how it is. So so it's, it's a matter of understanding. If you just read this, it's a, it's a funny way of uh, interpretation. So my teacher pointed me with a ruler and said, at the end of this ruler, there is an idiot. Right. So the students got definition after asking which end. Right. So can you make out that how we are, uh, you know, what we are talking in what context in what reference it may fall back uh, on us as well. Right. So so it is very important uh, to differentiate uh, your teaching method, whether it's teacher centered or the learner centered. So these are some principles. They are very theoretical concepts, but uh, they are very relevant uh, in today's time. Uh, using uh, previous knowledge, providing for individual differences, uh, principle of readiness, meaningfulness, and defining the specific objectives of the lesson, proceeding from simple to complex, proceeding from concrete to abstract, and proceeding from general to specific, and proceeding from known to unknown. So these are basic principles of teaching, and that is how all, all the teachers here uh, the presented this uh, forum, uh, they have been following all this. But how they are converting those principles into practice, that is, uh, that is a matter of uh, discussion because each one of us, uh, we have a different uh, ways in delivering the content. Our pedagogy varies from person to person and faculty to faculty. So, so these guiding principles in the selection and the use of strategic teaching methods, right? Uh, the learning is an active process. Process. And uh, you know, if you if you look at the data, seventy five percent retention rate in learning by doing, and ninety percent re retention rate learning by teaching others. So, what is more important is the peer peer learning, where the students are encouraged to train 
other people, teach other people. And it, that comes after that by, while introducing the discussion forum and the discussion group. The more you engage them as a part of the content delivery, they will become more because they will have to do multiple exercises to deliver the content. So if you look at this, uh, uh, these principles and the selection of uh, teaching strategies, uh, the more students are involved in learning, uh, the more and better the learning is. So if you look at the taste, smell, touch, hearing, and sight. So sight is 75%, right? So this is the most important aspect because I, uh, you know, eye is, uh, is a sensory network uh, which is, I think, 80, more than 80% of the sensory network of human body uh, is based on uh, eyes, right? So most of the things are adopted and accepted and approved by the by looking at it, then hearing, then touch, then smell, then taste. So uh, in, a, in a block diagram, the, the teaching process is uh, the plan, implement, and evaluate, right? But if we don't have and if we don't create the feedback, and reflections, then this process will fail. So feedback mechanism is such an important you know, part of entire teaching process. If we don't do that, so our efforts will not be materialized and will not contribute to any, any, you know, any teaching process. So if you look at you know, teaching, uh, if we divide into the phases and, and operations, so how we can convert, Mr. Jackson has defined it very, very, uh, categorically, the stage one where the pre-active stage, stage two is the interactive stage, and stage three the post-active stage. So if we look at the operations, so stage one is leading to the fixing of goals and content, decision about strategies, and stage two is talking about the diagnosis of the learners and actions and reactions. Then stage three is appropriate testing devices and feedback and testing. So most important, stage three where you know, you need to test uh, whatever the tools and devices you are using and how effective your bank, uh, feedback network is. So uh, in the planning phase, which includes the decision like, you know, the needs of the learner, uh, achievable goals and objectives to meet the needs, selection of the content to be taught, motivation to carry out the goal, approach most fit to carry out the goals, and evaluation process to measure the learning outcome. So today's session is more about, I mean, focused on, you know, the evaluation and the assessment, uh, but we, we need to clearly define uh, the principles of the teaching uh, by which we are eligible to, uh, you know, evaluate anybody. So this is important, whether we are following all those principles or not, or, or is there any gap in between? So some planning like, uh, you know, what are the considerations like learners, ability of material, time requirement uh, of particular activity, the strategy need to be achieved, the objective. So how do we define and how, how many of us, we actually invest time to define the strategies uh, to achieve the objective. And then we come to this implementation state where it's based on the objective implementation needs to put into an action the different activities in order to achieve the objectives through the subject matter. Then interaction of the teacher and learner is important in the accomplishment of the plan. So are we ready with our plan? Yes or no? How are we making the plan? Like I said, the storyboard is ready or not. I, either we are creating the storyboard for each and every lecture or we, have, we use the common storyboard for every lecture. Use the different teaching style and strategies are included in this case. So how many you know, teaching styles uh, do we know? We Do we adapt? Uh, do we really you know, use the best practices, uh, you know, uh, from different universities and institutions. Uh, are we influenced with them? Are we, are we, you know, comply to those uh, definitions which are actually defining the teaching process? Then we have the evaluation phase in which uh, a match of the objective with the learning outcomes will be made. So all of us, we, we carry out this process, whether in the form of the classroom test or the final examinations. Then the answer is the question if the plan and implementation have been successfully achieved. And what is the feedback finally uh, uh, out of that evaluation phase? And that is why, you know, you might have seen that every year the CBSE, ICSE, and other boards uh, at the you know, 12th level, uh, they come out with some kind of statistics where they publish that this is the percentage 
you know, of the successful students. So what is the past percentage, gender-wise, uh, you know, successful percentage, and so on and so forth. But it is entirely based on evaluation uh, method and what best practices you are using to evaluate the people. So, and now this year in this uh, particular year, is so interesting that uh, CBSE exams did not happen, right? And now it's a, it was a huge challenge on entire CBSE board where that how to evaluate these students. So they come out with various models and they finally came out with 30, 30, 40 on the basis of which they will you know, calculate. But now again, every model has its own pros and cons, right? So, uh, so which one to follow? But uh, to look at the diversity, look at the volumes so they have come out with, one method. So still, it is an evaluation. So they have not carried out any examination, any written test, or something like that. But still, they are the, all the students, maybe you know, millions of students. They are being evaluated, and they will have their results in place very soon. So it is not mandatory that uh, you need to actually do the uh, pen paper, you know, testing and all that. The, you can look at different other attributes of our students and uh, you can carry out the evaluation. But this is a very uh, extraordinary you know, situation where uh, you know, one has to take such kind of decisions. So these are some of the basic assumptions where uh, the teaching is goal-oriented with the change of behavior as ultimate end, right? And that teaching is a, a rational and the reflective process. Uh, the teacher by their action can influence learners to change their own thinking or desired behavior, thus teaching is, is a way of changing behavior through the intervention of the teacher. This is very, very important aspect of uh, teaching. So how we uh, look at the behavioral component of the students while we are teaching them. And that is why all of us, all, all the teachers, while they were teaching in a class, or whether it's a physical or the virtual or real, whatever, they, they do notice the behavioral uh, aspects of uh, of students and some of the students they they you know mark in terms of their great behavior their moderate behavior their volatile behavior their inappropriate behavior so we need to find out the reason and why uh, find out the cause why these things are happening and how a teacher can influence to you know look into their problems and bring them into the mainstream so good teaching is uh, where you know uh, which is well planned and uh, where uh, activities are interrelated to each other so it depends on what kind of uh, activities we involve in our teaching uh, you know methods it should it should go beyond recall of information so how the information flow is uh, is is embedded in your teaching plan is very critical for example if i say you know um, if I define that the teaching is what is the bottom line is uh, the teacher's job is uh, to collect the data, right? So look at the data and teach the students how that data is converted into information and further how that information is converted into the knowledge. And again, at the higher education, how that knowledge is converted into the wisdom. So this is the cycle. And you know, we take, uh, you know, whole lifetime to achieve and complete this cycle. So from data to wisdom. So this is very important, uh, you know, aspect where all of us, we are, uh, you know, working very hard uh, to be the part of the cycle and how effectively we can complete even, even the 50% of it or 60% or 70% of it, right? So uh, the teaching is that provide learning experience uh, or situation that will ensure understanding application and critical thinking, right? So we need to invoke the young uh, you know, students' mind and we need to engage them into the constructive you know, discussions and constructive activities uh, so that they can innovate things, they can, uh, they can uh, you know, think, uh, start thinking you know, out of the box so that they can bring in good piece of knowledge, they can generate good piece of knowledge for their uh, productivity enhancement, right? So uh, the process of learning is to teach, is to make someone to learn. So to teach is to make someone to learn what all we need to do, right? So are we equipped enough? Are we qualified enough to make them learn, right? So it is not just to teach. It is the art of students. So they start learning things. So 
there are n number of things and that is why the pedagogy is the most critical part of, of any teaching process. And that is why teachers are constantly working hard to make them learn. That is one process, but to enable them to learn better is a, is an ultimate aim. So if you look at this, this is uh, it's my favorite that uh, the student is asking a question. If a single teacher can't teach us all the subjects, then how could it, you expect a single student to learn all the subjects? Isn't it interesting? So, you know, this is a very, very interesting situation. So we are expecting too much out of the students, right? So are we trying to uh, load them with, you know, defined curriculum on their, uh, you know, on their shoulders, which they are not supposed to carry? Or are we expecting a lot? Because, you know, this observation is very, very well defined. Because if one teacher can't teach all subjects, why one student can learn all, all subjects? So, but it is not that. It's that how to how we are making them enable to think on those domains. So it is not the equaling, uh, you know, equating student that the teacher teacher is supposed to be a domain expert. So he is, uh, you know, looked at with a different perspective. But the student is is the receiver of all the information and how that information or the knowledge converted into the information, converted information, which is which we call knowledge, is being transferred to students in a more uh, effective way so that student is more responsive to all those subjects, uh, areas. So now we come to the learning, where uh, the learning is uh, defined as a change in an individual's behavior caused by experiences or self-activities. So what are the ways in which we are engaging them uh, in terms of some experimental or some through case studies or some uh, games, some you know engagement plans? Then it implies that the learning can only happen through the individual's activity or his own doing. So that is why uh, you know it's uh, it's a great saying that that's the kid till he is at home, he or she is at home is a great learning is the learning pace is phenomenal. The moment the kid is admitted to a school, his learning ability becomes very questionable. So free learning or the constraint learning and uh, teacher-centered learning, all these things are to be considered, right? Why a kid become more constrained by, when he is admitted to a formal English and which we call the school or the education uh, you know, system. So which implies that the learning can only happen through individual activities or its own doing. So the kid, when he's free at home, right, he'll be, uh, he learns so many things by his own doing. Interaction with different articles, objects, and individuals, making him more you know, capable and uh, more informed by his own uh, you know, actions. And that is why it can be intentional or unintentional. So these are two principles of learning process, behavioral and cognitive. So these are two important ones. So uh, uh, all the teachers should have little idea for both the uh, learning process by which they can change their teaching method. So these are some of the theoretical aspects which emphasizes you know, the observable behavior such as new skills, knowledge, and attitude which can be demonstrated. So over the last five years, if you see uh, in terms of the skills, and this is the outcome and is well researched document where the students are a step ahead in terms of technical skills than uh, their own teachers, right? Uh, which is evident uh, in the last one and a half year when we compile the you know, information of online teaching and learning. So students, they use the different technologies to make them available. Sometimes they uh, use the technology uh, to be better in, uh, engaged with the session. Sometimes a uh, few students uh, we have observed, they, they try to fool the system by using the same technology. And there are many other examples, right? So the behavioral learning theory is observable and measurable. So, but how to observe and measure, this is the method. And that is why we are relating it with the you know, the assessment, the evaluation. If the individual has changed behavior, he has learned, right? If you see there is a dramatic change or maybe a very uh, minute change in the behavior of a student's what academic behavior, 
uh, of a student, then it means there is impact of what you have been teaching. In the cognitive learning theory, it's a concern with the human learning, which is uh, unobservable uh, mental process and are used to learn and remember new information or acquired skills, right? Uh, which, which is related to concept of meaningful learning through cognitive models. So this is another you know, uh, learning theory, which is based on the cognitive science. So, so these two aspects of learning uh, needs to be understood uh, carefully by the teachers so that their assessment and evaluation can be more, more effective and more accurate. So if you look at this again, uh, I would like to share this uh, you know, teacher-student conversation where the teacher is asking why you are late, Joseph. And Joseph replied because of a signboard down the road. And the teacher asked, what does the signboard uh, have to do with your being late? So Joseph said, to the signboard says, school ahead, go slow. So what we are communicating, how we are communicating, and what is the impact of that statement on a normal person? So it, 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 is, it is very, very important. And that is why, you know, globally, uh, the impact of any advertisement is measured by their statement, how they are stating. Even there is no word, just one picture can make a lot of difference. So what are we communicating, how we are communicating is very, very important. So there are three models uh, of teaching incurred on um, cognitive learning theory. One is a discovery-based, uh, reception, and event of learning. So in the discovery uh, learning, it states the individual learn from his own discovery of the environment. Learners are inherently curious. Thus, they can be self-motivated until they find the answer to the problem. Then gave rise to the emerging theory of constructivism and self-learning. So learning is flexible, exploratory, and independent. So this is the, uh, these are the aspects of the discovery learning, where uh, now most of the uh, schools and the institutions, they are heading towards that. So there is no formal arrangement of uh, a classroom and all that. It's all discovery model. I have personally mm, uh, visited a school, I think it is in South Delhi near Kutub area. This is so fantastic. There is no curriculum uh, in terms of the syllabus, right? So it's all curriculum is based on activities, right? So I, when I visited that, the personally I saw the teacher was, uh, you know, telling and teaching the kids about the colors, right? And uh, the way of describing the colors is not just by showing them the chart or something else. The first statement of a teacher was, let's paint today, right? So everyone was given a wall, a portion of wall, and the full of colors, and they were told, just pick an, any color and paint the wall. And in no time, the wall became so beautiful by their individual perception, understanding, visualization, and that was a beautiful collage, right, in no, in no time. So that is why without showing them the chart, without uh, telling them uh, the definition of the colors, arrangement of colors, first they did that, they carried out that exercise, then the teacher started, uh, what color, uh, you know, uh, you, did you use? So students and the, those small kids, they start telling, you know, this is, uh, um, uh, this I use this color and they, they figured out themselves what is the name of that color and so on and so forth. So these are the, you know, impact uh, of different ways of teaching and all. I would like to share one more, uh, you know, the, you know, case study is, is by one of the famous educationists uh, from Britain, uh, Sir John, I think I, I forget his full name, but uh, he was uh, mentioning that this classroom, uh, the small children were given the task uh, to draw the picture of, uh, of anything, right? So everybody was making something, something, something. And after some time, uh, the teacher was looking at everybody's uh, you know, drawing and he was curious to see uh, one girl was drawing something and he asked the girl that, what are you drawing? The girl replied that uh, I'm uh, drawing the picture of God. So the teacher said, uh, how do you know the God looks like this? So to, uh, this, the girl immediately said, I think that uh, the God looks like this because uh, no one sees that. So the look at the imagination and the power of visualization. Uh, if you are giving the free atmosphere to the students, they can, uh, you know, think out of the box. And because uh, by by the fact that the teacher was 
teacher was having no answer to that because the teacher himself doesn't know how, how the God looks like. So that is how the learning environments makes the students more creative, more imaginative, and uh, more meaningful when they are left in a free environment, but in a guided, you know, uh, with a, but engaged in, in, in activities. Uh, so uh, another one is the reception learning where uh, and though the learner are inherently you know, curious, they may not be able to know what is important or relevant, and uh, they need external motivation in order to learn. Then also emphasize that prior learning is important in order to learn new things, uh, because knowledge continuously changes uh, once it is in the learner's mind. So once so 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 our job is is to seed methodologically the curiosity about any, any any concept. So they keep thinking about that, and they come out with uh, their own you know uh, questions which are not driven by fear or, or not driven by the books or the resources they are going through. So uh, events of learning where, you know, the motivation phase, the apprehending phase, the acquisition phase, and the retention phase. All of you are aware of it. I'm just, you know, um, just, just for the sake of recalling. Uh, the fifth one is the recall phase, generalization phase, and the feedback, the feedback phase. So this is uh, the seventh point, which is the feedback phase is the most important. And somehow we miss it uh, in our processes because uh, either we are hard pressed with time, we are hard pressed with curriculum and all that, we somehow skip this part, which is the most critical component. And that is why uh, if we, we don't have the feedback, uh, we, are, uh, we are not eligible to carry out this uh, you know, assessment. So there are multiple ways of assessment. You, you are all aware, the summative assessment and the formative assessment. In summative, we have, the goal is a uh, uh, to evaluate students learning at the end of the instructional unit for, for example that is why we have the internal assessment in our Delhi university where you have to carry out a few tests uh, within the semester so there are two or three tests defined in the curriculum right and uh, you give uh, the questions on a piece of paper they need to answer them you take it back and you evaluate right and you give some marking and you just display so this is uh, this looks to be is so mechanical, right? So uh, and it appears that to be we do not have any, uh, any differentiation while we are doing the classroom tests or we are conducting the semester exams. So there is no the process is same. You are giving the set of questions in the semester exam. We are giving the set of questions and students are doing doing the same same kind of exercise and we are evaluating in terms of giving the marks and the marks are reflected in the report card. So. Uh, the process is same, but but the objective is entirely different. Unless until we have uh, the comparative, uh, you know, analysis of all the semesters uh, throughout the semester in different, uh, you know, stages. We uh, and without the feedback, we we the the assessment doesn't have any any mean. So summative assessment are often high stakes, which means that they have a high point value, and that is why the value of internal assessment is very high. It's twenty five percent and which is a component of uh, even the attendance and the test and the, the regularity and all that. So uh, it, it happens as a midterm exam or the final project or, or as a piece of the paper. In the formative assessment, uh, the goal is uh, to monitor students learning to provide ongoing feedback that can be used by, by instructor to improve their teaching and by students to improve their learning, right? So the more specifically, uh, it helps students identify their strength and weakness and target areas that need work. It helps faculty recognize where the students are struggling and address problem immediately. So both the assessment uh, methodology, summative and the formative, they have they are very, very important uh, you know, component. Uh, in the formative assessment, which is really important for the faculty and then the students, because as a faculty, we have to understand and note down uh, the pain areas of a student who has been facing uh, in a particular subject or in a particular unit or maybe. So it, it is a, uh, the concept of, uh, you know, understanding students' pain areas by, by involving them in certain activities and different methods of assessments. So if you look at the basic levels of learning, so uh, you can relate it very well uh, where we are, what we are trying to do. 
so the rote learning is where the ability to repeat something back which was learned but not understood right then the se- the next level is the understanding where to comprehend or grasp the nature of meaning of something then next level is the application where the act of putting something to use that has been learned and understood then the last one is the correlation where whatever learning has been made so and we can associate that what has been learned understood and applied with previous or subsequent learning so look at this debate and and, and you will find uh, where we stand right whether we are the part of the rote learning or at the level of understanding or application or correlation and then we come to the information processing which uh, i was saying that how uh, we complete the cycle from data to wisdom right where the knowledge coming in and the information is coming in and uh, and many other things so if we compare that this it looks like electronics diagram but it is not it's a memory system how it works like there's a sensory network uh, where it registers what you are looking at what you are sensing it right so all the inputs are coming from environment right then it goes to the working of the short term memory which is our classroom like uh, what all being taught and how how much student can can remember can store into their short term memory and there is a long term memory how effective we are in our content delivery so that everything goes uh, in their long term memory right so uh, this is the information uh, you know processing uh, diagram which is very well connected with the educational teaching and learning processes which is actually is being used in the computer systems right so this is the integrated approach in corporate successful research based and brain based instruction strategy so this was a very famous uh, paper written by wolf in 2001 where uh, without rehearsal or constant attention information remains in working memory for about uh, 15 to 20 seconds right learning is a process of building neural network which is everyone is aware of what the neural network is because our neural system makes uh, makes us more uh, you know capable while we are uh, while we are ex- excited enough to accept the information in such a way that we can retain them for a longer period of time so our brains have difficulty comprehending is a large number because we have nothing in our experience to hook them so an eye contains nearly 70% of the body sensory receptors and sends millions of signals every second along the optic nerve to the visual processing of the brain and that is why you know if we compare we started our uh, you know teaching and learning what was the first tool and technology was provided to us uh maybe i'm not able to interact with people but uh the blackboard where we used to draw and write with the chalk that was the first multimedia technology we we use in the classroom where we draw something we write something and many of the students can see at the same time right and we migrated then we use a you know transparency based system where we write with the trans you know the markers and it was put out to the lamp and that was expanded view through a device and that is how uh, that the second generation then the third generation it was replaced by the you know slides where the you know the with the multimedia projector you uh, with the help of the software like powerpoint and other right you make very interactive and interesting slides right so that the students are engaged what is uh, written on that and how visually you know uh, you know powerful they are to convey the, the message and uh, convey the meaning of what is being discussed in the classroom right then we have the forgetting part where the, the fading of tissues and uh, the link fades uh, interference which is the confusion distortion <coughs> is a misinterpretation due to the imperfect recall so the learning and the forgetting is other to the how to prevent the forgetting and there is active interaction in a multiple context and the practice is meaning is the review use in a new learning activity so how many activity we introduce within the classroom Uh, for example in the science based uh, programs at undergraduate and the post graduate level there are multiple ways of activities uh, we introduce uh, in the lab uh, to engage the students to perform the experiments in different ways right and uh, different kind of uh, uh, apparatus and the equipment can give you the similar kind of uh, output but 
because we they have to come comparatively analyze which which uh, you know set up which experiments uh, you know uh, with different equipments to give what kind of results so the moment we start engaging them uh, with uh, loads of activities uh, they will start remembering more similarly coming back to the memory system so <clears throat> this is what we are talking that more and more uh, rehearsal in the middle we see recording we see and, and the processes and store and recall the more they will learn and they will retain everything so ultimately you know uh, this is i believe and if i can if i cannot learn the way you teach will you teach me the way i can learn so this is the biggest question uh, we are facing uh, and we need to ask ourselves uh, that can we can we achieve uh, you know uh, we can can we can we answer this kind of situation where the students uh, is not able to learn the way i am teaching right can i change my teaching method can i change my teaching style so that the student can learn so by uh, you know using this i'll i'll be more happy to interact with you on this thank you so much yeah So, Dr. Anjali, can we, or Dr. Saluni, can yes. we have some interaction now? Because I wanted yes, sir. to yes. keep it more interactive. So, I, I, I can do whatever I wanted to, so that uh, we can talk on more on, uh, you know, uh, assessment models and, and, and the evaluation Saluni, models. can you please read out the questions? If yes, ma'am. Yeah, please. Just give me a minute. I'm just reading. Yeah. Actually, there are a lot of uh, reviews about how information and how informative the session was, but I can't see any questions as of now on the <laughs> chat. Right, right. So we can start with the assessment part. I'll just uh, also help Saloni look for the question one more time. We'll go sure. through it fast. If there is any question, sir, I'll interrupt you and we'll ask, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So, so actually, I have uh, you know the slides and all, everything have been done because uh, I thought that this is the part where you know uh, we need to discuss more in terms of the methods and all. I have described all of them. Right. Yes, sir. So that we can discuss already, certain. Yeah, we can discuss we have certain. We already case discussed today. about the learners. That is point of view that it is there. But sir, uh, definitely, what uh, we need uh, need to look into, like uh, the uh, that the notifications that have come regarding the blended learning. Definitely, we more. Yeah, some light has to be thrown even on the fact that how we are having it. That what are the expectations from the learners, like. You see, uh, you're right. So, you see, the blended learning is not a new concept, right? It is 20 years old, right? Yeah. And uh, now, uh, when we relate blended learning and the e-learning at the same time, and the e-learning is nothing new, e-learning doesn't exist now. E-learning has died already, right? It was yeah. started uh, more than 30 years back. And then uh, the technology was different, then the approach was different. And then uh, after a few years, then the concept of blended learning started because there was no possibility of 100% e-learning. Then, you know, the group of people, researchers, they, they thought that the blended learning would be an effective way where we can divide the load and we can put something onto the e-learning, you know, framework where the students are readily, you know, access whatever material is being created and the interactivity can bring into the classroom, right? So now the blended learning has taken a new shape altogether because everything is now virtual, right? So what do you need to blend, right? And now we are struggling, what we are struggling that to blend uh, the real component into the virtual, you know, and what, right? For example, the life sciences, you know, experiments in the you know, last session I discussed, this is very difficult to blend with, very right? Difficult, yeah. Very difficult and very difficult to bring in the real life component into the virtual platform. But still there are ways in which we can do that. So my fellow colleagues at South Campus, they are creating interactive videos, right, in their lab. They are performing the 
experiments and their the entire process is being recorded but it is giving you the sense of okay how the things can be done but it is not giving you the feel that you are doing that experiment so that will come only when we create the simulation right interactive simulations uh, why the students would actually be you know picking the test tube or the picking the instrument and you know uh, you know pouring the desired chemical into that and adding into the other substance and performing that but you see um, i'm more keen in you know supporting this life sciences people because you know their uh, you know experiments uh, goes from you know 6 8 hours to 24 hours to 72 hours and 128 hours and so on and so forth up to 6 months and they need to observe each and everything right and in between they need to you know uh, you know add some um, you know some chemicals or some fertilizers to their plants once they are they growing their plants in a constrained environment so that is also getting virtualized because we have added the cameras and all those things right from their homes they can monitor the activities and they can guide the you know helper who is residing in the campus go there right add this add water this and that and they still they can monitor but we are able to achieve some part of it not everything can be done so the experiential learning is missing now i'm not able to experience that what i was intended to right so but so blended learning is no longer exists now tell me where is the plan what to blend and how to blend right so now everything needs to be virtualized and we are trying to integrate the real life component in our in our processes so that is what i really agree that with you that uh, really it is there that definitely we are in a age where we have to blend and balance the things where we to an extent we have to go into virtual thing but at the same time face to face interactions like you have just given an example of life sciences we have examples in commerce like uh, when we are talking about stock trading and things like that so it is not just that ki we are just talking about uh, virtual training and all that all the time we do want that the students should have some idea uh, the way in which when the uh, fluctuations are taking in the market we have to we want that students to experience it so maybe that is why we go into certain mock stocks or something like that or take them to different uh, um, uh, stock exchanges so that uh, students have a feel that not just theoretical knowledge is required or things we can create or do it through virtual platforms we really need to have that uh, personal interaction ya wo bahut zaruri hai students ke sath right. that is so so that is why I'm, i'm more concerned about the pedagogy right so yeah. as i said you see you are taking example of commerce you are taking example of life sciences and so and so other for right the faculty is more more uh, you know uh, required to experiment with their own pedagogical concepts because times have changed right so we need to deliberate upon uh, you know what has happened in the last one and a half year and as i as i mentioned you know, the pedagogy is one most critical thing which varies from person to person right okay. so if i am teaching in certain ways and my students are not happy with me the way i deliver the content it doesn't make any sense right yes, so either i need to work on that i need to embed a certain other component maybe i need to take somebody's help right to make my content more interactive more effective so definitely uh, really even the discussions that we have had over this platform and all that definitely a lot of discussion has happened on that how the teaching pedagogy and what are the expectations from the teachers that are there really being pointed out a lot but right. really my concern especially personally is that definitely a certain uh, training is required even on the learners side because uh, like as you have said that if we are if definitely as a teacher i am aware enough to go through all the teaching pedagogies and i really imbibe that into my teaching system as is being expected but at the same time on the learners point of view if they are not recipient enough to take up that thing really that is one thing which is of concern so i really think so yes, i yes. think uh, something training or some kind of a thing awareness is even required on the learner side which right. is really so so the constant engagement of teacher with the new skills right which are evolving over a period of time so this is most critical because the skill enhancement you know it's very important for the teaching community rather than the learning community yeah
so but yes concern on the side of student is also i think uh, that is one thing because teaching community is really trying really hard i know no no <laughs> i i really appreciate i really appreciate that despite everything the attention span is so short uh, we really facing trouble is having that <laughs> right 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 you're right you're right and and also the learning and the, the these teaching platforms they vary from one platform to another platform and suddenly you are in a fix that which is the most effective one uh, for me to deliver any any content to the students right and to engage them for a longer period of time and not only that the no verbal there the you know attention by involving them into different activities so do we have the enough platform uh, to introduce activity based learning into yeah. the different you know uh, this kind of platforms yes, uh, really having a activity based learning like okay fine lecture based learning and videos is something that we can really uh, do it very quickly but when it comes out to activity based learning uh, we find that many of us are lacking in that particular skill that is really required so that we are able to make the lectures or something more interesting so everybody is uh, making an effort on a personal basis but definitely some uh, training uh, or some kind of a centralized training or something is really required even for the teachers so that they can have this kind of a activity based or project based definitely we are talking about case methods and all that but uh, to an extent really uh, training on that is also required even on the part of the teachers that is what they say but i think uh, right, in right. a way we need to have a balance on both the teacher side as well as the learner side so that we are even able to have a better delivery and an entire uh, learning process becomes much easier and more enriching that is what saloni any more from the panel? we have we have received a couple of questions yeah yes please just read them out it is not the nature of the subject that decides whether seeing or listening or something else can be a more effective method of learning so we can you repeat uh, is it not the nature of the subject that decides whether seeing or learning or something else can be a more effective method of learning you see is debatable this is very interesting right why because you know if we if we never had any technology then uh, what uh, the way so entirely depends on the pedagogy or, or the ways in which the teacher used to explain the concepts of any whether it's a science arts humanities right and now with the help of technologies right so now you you are embedded and skilled enough uh, or empowered with the with the visualization you know factor and the you know speech factor and content factor everything has been embedded it doesn't mean that the previous teaching were bad and uh, you have produce the great learners and the great scientists you know uh, on the basis of the previous teaching and learning methods which were not influenced by the technology what we have been using these days right so i think this is evolving over a period of time and it depends on an individual that how 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 these components of uh, visualization and and uh, you know uh, uh, technology assisted uh, content delivery and all that is being utilized so even even today you can clearly differentiate the people and the teachers who are more effective with the teach uh, you know with these skills and the technology who are still not very effective with these in these kind of technologies right even in the same domain you can easily differentiate them so it's ultimately everything decides on the teacher right even without any technology the teacher should be able to convey the concept and make them understand how to be you know how to learn it more effectively so as you said that our task is to make someone learn so no matter what approach we correct. use the ultimate aim should be to so so if you, if if you get to the last slide and the students are saying that i don't know i don't understand the way you are teaching me to make me learn so can you change your teaching style to make me learn so this is the question we have to debate on right this is the real thing where we have to debate so there is another question which is do you think that excessive use of ict tools will compromise on basic skill sets of students required for descriptive subjects right <laughs> so you are talking about this recent time or you know uh, or, or the period of uh, before the pandemic you are talking about this uh, past one year so the participants haven't written anything but 
I assume it will be related yeah. so, to the so, pandemic. Correct, time. correct, correct. So, so first question we have to ask ourselves: Are we are we making enough interactive uh, assessment tools, assessment items to make them learn better? Or are we repeating whatever is happening in the past one year, two year, three year, so that we are encouraging students to learn only that portion to produce? So that is why the rote learning, understanding the ladder I've shown, right? So we are still in the rote learning. No one understands what is being taught, but we are rep reproducing the same thing. And we are happy about it. So we need to understand, we need to make a connection between whether uh, the students can make any difference or have you observed any change in the students in the behavior so that you can understand, okay, this is now is more learned, right, in terms of the content. Absolutely correct, sir. So there's one more question which states, yeah. in ancient India and some other places, listening or shruti was the essential means of teaching. How effective it was actually, sir, as you said, seeing constitutes the major part of learning. Correct. So the, so I said the visual component is uh, more than 80% because it is driven by the 80% of the sensory network of the human, uh, human system, right? So whatever we see, we understand, we experience in terms of in the visual component and then is supported by what we hear, right? And then what we touch and what we smell and what we taste, right? That's a hierarchy. So maximum impact is coming when uh, you visualize things, when you see things and receiving the information uh, in terms of that object. So Shruti, as you rightly said, Shruti and hearing. Shruti is hearing. The visual impact is what is there, not? Yes, so listening or shruti. Yeah, listening or shruti. Shruti, shruti means what you are hearing. Listening. So what you are listening, what you are seeing, and supported by what you are hearing, right? If you cut down on the, you know, the first component, what you are seeing, then you are the second best thing is the hearing. How much you are, you know, absorbing, how much you are getting out of uh, based on your hearing component. Content, sorry. Right, so together the combination is a good combination, so it's going to work well. And of course, and there are multiple theories, like, you know, even uh, if you, now this is a very nice standard environment, but when you're looking at the, you know, the students or the people who are, who are uh, especially able in terms of uh, their visual capability or hearing capability, still they are doing wonders, right? So there, that is what I'm saying, the sensory network of a human system makes a lot of difference, right? So if you your one sensor network is weaker, your other sensor network would dominate and will try to compensate that, that loss, right? So it doesn't mean that if you don't have these two components, you can't perform, you can't do anything. You can still do any do many things, right? In a, in a, in a great, with the greater details. Absolutely correct, sir. Uh, we don't have any more questions. People are in awe. The participants are really saying that a lot of new concepts have been covered as well as cleared, and this session has been very, very fruitful. For there the is day. absolutely nothing new. This is all what we have been experiencing, what we have learned from our past, right, and what has been detailed out. But now the time has come to, you know, bring uh, uh, them together in the present context, right? In the pandemic time, that how we are struggling and how we are still trying to, you know, put things together uh, to justify our, our role as a teacher, right? Absolutely. So as you said, up today, to a lot of participants, I think I can speak on behalf of them, the approach is very clear. <laughs> the way you've explained, it's, it's brought about a lot of clarity in the I don't podcast. know. I don't know. I thought it was uh, make some, some sense. But, but, but... We need to be very clear in terms of the assessment part. We simply, uh, I'm sorry, but we are still mechanical on that, that aspect. We don't have the feedback system, right, in, in place so that we can, we cannot, uh, logically, we are not eligible to take the assessment. <laughs> sir, but I logically, take it that way. <laughs> I take it that way that, sir, after a point of time, like the way you have explained about the learners, psychology and the things, like uh, after a point of time, uh, we are just all the streams seem to combine that whether you are from science or we from commerce. It doesn't matter. Education it doesn't is matter. Education. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so doesn't we matter. all have to know.
know about we have to be yeah, psychologists principles principles right yeah, subject to, domain subject expertise comes later yes sir. much later yeah so as a teacher all of us have to be psychologists we have to be uh, physicists Correct. we have to be philosopher philosopher yeah we you, have to be philosophers philosopher. so that is what yes. is required <laughs> yes yes so after a uh, point and i think with this concept of blended learning coming in and all we really have to really uh, uh, boot up more uh, fast ayash oh. more tightly to ensure that i hope so yeah i hope so <laughs> the objective is to make uh, teachers more productive yeah that is what it is so right yes sir all right Thank you so very much for having sir, me. Can we conclude the session, sir? Then? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, please. Uh, may I request Saloni to present a vote of formal vote of thanks, sir? Oh, no, it's all fine. We are the, we are no, colleagues. Sir, just, please don't say thanks. We yeah, are no, just sir, colleagues. No, it is something. Uh, it is something a uh, ritual that has to be taken up. Oh, like that. Goodness. What is the protocol uh, of our elders that we have to follow? Just as a second will be sir. Please, Saloni. A formal vote of thanks. And sir, honestly, it's an honor to deliver the vote of thanks to you. It gives me immense pleasure to deliver Thank the vote so of much. thanks to you, sir. It was a very, very enriching and very, very fruitful session. Your approach, your presentation, your clarity has brought about uh, so much, so much clarity for us, and with such ease that I'm sure every participant. I can see the messages. Every participant is saying that. it was such a fruitful session and honestly they are all very very happy to hear from you again and sir i would just like to say that your the way you presented and the way you said that your best quote is that if a student is asking us you know if they are learning five subjects or in one go then you know what do they expect from us if we are just teaching one they are learning five so we shouldn't be expecting too much from them and <laughs> really so true sir we often hear them saying that and i think this is this is what we have to ponder upon this is what we have to think upon and make our approach uh, so effective and you know try out so many new technologies today with the pandemic i think we somehow blessed that we have been able to explore these many technologies and this is the time when we can put them in a very fruitful manner we can put them to use so i would just like to say that your that quote will definitely make me put a little more effort in my teaching so that I can answer that question confidently the next time they ask me. I mean, I mean. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, Thank you so much. Okay, sir. Thank you. So, thanks. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much, sir. At least this session you have inspired two of the teachers that are there. Tell me, sir. And I think the day is made for us, sir. All of us. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Namaskar. Thank you, sir. Namaskar. Namaskar. Can I stop the recording? And, uh, Acha, you you are the host, please.